Good afternoon, everybody. And I mean, it's afternoon here, depending on where you're joining us from. Um, let me see everybody so I can. So I am Ishan Ono, Thinking Food Futures co-curator, along with my dear colleague, Livia Alexander, and our curatorial assistant, Shayna Yoshida, is also here with us. And on behalf of our curatorial team and Residency Unlimited, the organization that hosts this event, we are pleased to welcome you to the second day of our virtual symposium and exhibition, Thinking Food Futures. And if you have been joining us in the uh, past events and also yesterday, welcome back. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, though Armenian history spans more than 3,500 years, the last century has radically altered it. The modern Armenian story has been deeply marked by cycles of forced dispersion and dispossession from the Ottoman era Armenian genocide of 1915 to the recent war in the de facto Republic of Archa Nagorno-Karabakh and through many other upheavals throughout the Caucasus and Middle East that have happened in between having suffered a tremendous loss of population, as well as homeland, food and culinary heritage remains one of the few indestructible spaces of Armenians to connect to their pasts. It's a space in which Armenians can recreate a tangible heritage that they often cannot physically access, but also express adaptability in the face of both global upheaval and the continued state-sponsored denial of their history. Today, we are pleased to welcome Liana Agajanian. Um, I did not check your pronunciation uh, with you, Liana. I hope uh, it is correct. Otherwise, please forgive me and correct me later. An internationally published journalist and writer who is currently tracing culinary heritage and food ways in the Armenian diaspora with her lecture, Manifesting Food Between Home and Homeland, Exploring Armenian Culinary Heritage in Flux. Liana Ag Ag Agajanian will provide an overview of Armenian culinary pathways and manifestations from the US to the Middle East, from the last century to the present through stories while also touching on lingering effects of ethnic cleansing, uh, war, food insecurity and displacement. Liana Agajanian is a journalist whose reporting ha has appeared in the New York Times, The Guardian, BBC, Al Jazeera Amer America, and The Atlantic, and several other publications. In 2015, she was awarded the Write a House Residency, a unique program for writers that takes place in Detroit, Mich Michigan. She's currently documenting the Armenian experience in America through food with her project, Dining in Diaspora, in which she traces the intersection of cuisine and agriculture with genocide, immigration, identity, and more. Thank you very much, Liana, for being with us today. The stage is yours. Thank you so much for having me, um, for the opportunity to be here, for the Residency Unlimited team, for giving me the opportunity. Um, yeah, so I would love to start with telling you a little bit about um, how I received an opportunity to move to Detroit and how that is how this project began. Um, it is where I started to seriously explore what Armenian diaspora meant in relation to food. And um, I started cooking with a local ladies guild there and realized that a lot of the food um, traditions that I had grown up with or the pathways that that culinary heritage had taken was very different to third, fourth generation um, Armenian Americans in the Midwest and um, that act of cooking with them is kind of what produced this project. Um, and, and that's how I began documenting this um, fragmented community that regenerated itself through food, but left a very important and quite hidden imprint on um, American culinary landscape and beyond. Um, so to me, cooking and practicing this heritage is a revolutionary act in a lot of ways. It feels very profound. Um, it feels like resistance work uh, because of the uh, uh, 
our mutant story. And it is not just how we survive with sustenance, but how we keep our culture going. Um, and by that, what I mean is if Armenians stop cooking the food that they have been cooking for generations, uh, that will cease to exist. The culture will cease to exist because they don't have other places in which they can access those foods. They cannot go back to the places that they're descended from. And they're, they're in this um, purgatory of diaspora. And so it's very hard to access uh, that culture. Uh, the Armenian story is very long and complicated and has many details, but I'll try to concentrate on four stories that kind of encompass the last hundred years, um, cycles of dis uh, displacement, but resilience um, in that story. Um, so I will start to share my screen with you. Uh, so, give me one second. So, uh, who are Armenians? Before we kind of continue, I guess I will go over um, who Armenians are. Uh, they are an ethnic group to uh, native to what is now called the Armenian Highlands, which is generally classified as being in Western Asia. They're a population that is indigenous to a region that now encompasses countries like, of course, the Republic of Armenia, but also Iran, Georgia, as well as Turkey. Um, their history spans thousands of years. Um, they're frequently known for being the first nation to convert to Christianity in 301 AD. And generally speaking today, there are about um, around 10 million Armenians in the world, which is quite a small population when you compare it to other populations. But even though it's such an ancient community, it is still going through dynamic changes. Um, this map is just an illustration to show you what footprint Armenians have had in the region. If you look on the right hand side where it's yellow, that is, those are the current borders of the Republic of Armenia. And um, the dotted black line is historic Armenia, which is considered the Armenian Highlands. So they've been around and mixing with populations there for a very long time. Uh, the geographic regions in which Armenians lived uh, is considered where the first agricultural revolution took place. They were living there obviously with other populations, but this area encompasses the Fertile Crescent where 11,000 years ago, um, our history of humanity changed and we stopped hunting and gathering and became sedentary and started to domesticate crops and animals. A 2016 study from the journal Nature examined the genomes of 44 people who had lived thousands of years from um, ago from what is now considered present day Armenia, Turkey, Jordan, and Iran. And they found that there were several communities there that developed farming independently of each other and then spread that technology through Europe and the rest of Asia. Over time, the geography in which Armenians lived began to change. Um, Armenians have always had, I guess, the misfortune of being in the middle of warring empires and conquering kingdoms. And over time, they were conquered by the Byzantines, Romans, Persians, Russians, and um, Turkic empires. And they lived under Ottoman rule for 500 years. Uh, they contributed to and shaped the socioeconomic life of that empire. And um, they obviously had a huge impact on the foodways of that empire, although that isn't very clear uh, often. Um, so here you can see the areas of the Ottoman Empire where a lot of Armenians trace their roots, different areas. Um, and I'm sure if there are Armenians who are watching right now, I'm sure they can recognize some of the areas in which their ancestors probably came from. Um, so as the Ottoman Empire began to fall apart at the turn of the 20th century, uh, the Armenian as well as the Assyrian and Greek populations were subjected to a systemic mass slaughter where over 1 million people were killed. And that event today is known as the Armenian genocide. Um, here in this map, you can see deportation control centers, deportation stations, and deportation concentration and annihilation centers where Armenians who 
um, were subject to that mass slaughter. Um, this event radically shaped Armenian identity and existence in the modern era. Uh, Armenians were not only subject to ethnic cleansing, but vast amounts of dispossession, including their material wealth, uh, their cultural heritage, agricultural wealth, and of course with it, that went the, the knowledge to cultivate, grow and feed themselves. So Armenian food culture, what defines Armenian food culture? It's a living dynamic and changing food culture. It's a reflection of Armenian diverse history and geography and associated deeply with both joy and pain. It really has different meanings depending on who you ask. Um, and that is a reflection of the history again. So for example, I grew up in Iran uh, in an Armenian family. Um, I was born in Iran and I grew up in California. But if you ask me what Armenian food is and you ask someone from the Republic of Armenia what it is, and then you ask um, a Syrian Armenian, they're going to have very different answers for you. And that is just a testament to how, uh, what a wide web in, is encompassed under the heading of Armenian food. Um, it is a gateway to evoke an accessible heritage. Um, and so this really ties back to these thoughts of ethnic cleansing and genocide that Armenians have experienced. Um, what did that do to an entire community. It disconnected Armenians from their ancestral lands forever. They lost cultural and culinary heritage and all that remained with them were the memories and oral histories they had of, of the food that they, they took with them. So several things um, make the Armenian case really unique. In my view, uh, it's not really an immigration story although there are elements of immigration in it. As I mentioned before, it's really a story of forced dispersal rather than chosen. And so there are levels in which that um, heritage becomes erased even after the final act of genocide. So you have things like assimilation and then it's hard to maintain in, in the diaspora and then that eventually starts to disappear. Yet despite these things, Armenians have um, regenerated themselves through food and used it as a concept to transmit um, their stories and um, continue their existence. So um, one of the first things I'll talk about is the concept of the starving Armenian, and that is related to the genocide. Um, so forced starvation is a crime now under international law, but it has been used as a political tool against several populations, including Jews during the Holocaust, the Ukrainians, um, the Herero genocide in Namibia, and the Armenian genocide. Uh, this is a quote from the World Peace Foundation about how every instance of famine or acute food security today is at its core man-made and that starvation has effects uh, that uh, extend long beyond the actual event of the starvation, including intergenerational physical and cognitive harm, severe economic dep de deprivation, and more. Um, in the Armenian case, it was a policy that was exercised after massacres. Whoever was left or survived of the population, um, which were usually women, children, and, and elderly, were put on death marches. They were deprived of food, water, subject to rape and massacre. Uh, this photo is um, a photo from the collection of Armin Wagner, who was a German soldier stationed in the Ottoman Empire during this time. He was a witness to the genocide and his accounts are some of the most widely circulated. So in this photo, you see uh, a family of deportees on the road. In the next photo, um, foraging for grain, scattered deportees in a desert wasteland. And so these people were sent to the desert without any food or water as a way of destroying them. Um, there is actually a quote from uh, a man named Mehmed Chal Chalal Bey, who was um, often, often considered the Turkish Oscar Schindler. And he, he, he has a quote that says, what is the purpose of deporting the Armenians who have lived for centuries on these lands to the deserts of Derzor without water and lumber to construct new settlements? Unfortunately, it is impossible to, de to deny and distort the fact the purpose was to annihilate and they were annihilated. 
So these are some um, of the more graphic photos that you see of what happened during that time. Uh, usually orphans, usually women who were subjected to this. The ones that survived uh, ended up in camps that were run by uh, organizations, uh, some of them American, which I will cover. Uh, this is a Armenian orphan camp in Antalyas, Lebanon, and you can see just the vast amount of how many um, orphans were left over from the genocide. Here are Armenian orphans at a refugee camp in Iraq. Um, and so one of the things that emerged because of this devastation was the formation of the Near East Foundation, which was once called the Near East Relief. It's the oldest um, non-sectarian international development organization in the US and it was founded in response to these genocides. They actually still exist today with a presence in more than uh, 40 countries, but uh, what they did was they appealed to uh, Americans to save Armenian and Assyrian lives. They helped raise money for food and they did this through material they published, which you can see here. Um, mass produced images, they had a magazine, they put out advertisements, they published um, information about a lot of the orphans. Uh, and this poster over here is one of the most well known. It says, you won't let me starve, will you? I am little Shushan from Armenia. My home has been destroyed. Father was taken away. Mother starved because she gave me all the food. I am so hungry and cold. Thousands of other children are hungry and cold too. So this was some of the material they um, put out. But one side effect of the, this entire campaign was that at the time, uh, this is how Americans generally came to know Armenians as starving Armenians. The phrase kind of penetrated into um, the American psyche and stuck so much so that um, you see advertisements of that time. For example, this is an advertisement for General Electric um, refrigerators that mentions the idea of the starving Armenian. Um, it says that you can make your food up to a week in advance and then store them it, for confiscation by your quote, hungry Armenians. So that's really how Americans came to know Armenians at the time and the phrase stuck I'd say up until the probably the 80s, people I've interviewed have mentioned, especially if they were from places like the Midwest, that they were often referred to as the starving Armenians, which was very puzzling because um, they came from households that had very rich culture. They actually, it was the opposite. They never <laughs> went hungry. Um, so it was, it was just very interesting to hear that. Um, and so, when the Armenian community reestablished itself and started to open restaurants, people started to see that, you know, why is there this idea of the starving Armenian if they're so good at making food? Um, there was a column actually written in 1939 that touted Armenians as gastronomic Ar Armenians and said, whoever nicknamed them the starving Armenians. So you have these competing narratives. Um, this is an amazing book and I believe Arlene might be actually in this talk right now, which I'm very excited about because I'm such a big fan of her work. Um, but this is an amazing book uh, that kind of covers that perspective of the lingering effects of what happened. Um, she has a wonderful essay in it about how um, food has manifested for, for Armenian populations. And there's a great quote in it from an interviewee uh, from a woman named Lucy who says, they always want you to be thinner, but they always want to shove another dolma down your throat. It's so contradictory and you don't know what to do with it. And um, so most women think that their family's high priority on the, on the abundance of food is directly connected to the genocide. As we know, um, it, the effects of it don't stop when the act is committed. And so there are these lingering effects that stay. Um, and, you know, Arlene writes in her essay that um, some daughters think that for their mothers, people, uh, particularly if they were survivors of the genocide, the giving of food, feeding the family was central to their self-esteem as mothers. 
And furthermore, by feeding them Armenian food, which they considered to be healthy, they would ensure the survival of their husbands and children, and perhaps even by extension, the Arme Armenian people. And so, you know, this abundance of food was maybe a psychological way to overturn the idea of the starving Armenian and everything that Armenians had gone through. Um, there hasn't been too much research that I found about food deprivation and its lingering impact, but one study of Cambodian refugee women actually highlighted that the, the fact that they had experienced um, extensive food deprivation or insecurity led them to engage in unhealthful um, eating practices. One study about the transgenerational um, trauma effects of genocide, Armenian genocide survivors found that they had high risk of depression and anxiety. And as we know, these things can be related to broader eating disorders. Um, one interesting thing that I wanted to show is uh, the fact that this year there has obviously been a huge food insecurity crisis, I'm sure around the world, but particularly in America because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, in April, on April 24th, which is when Armenians generally commemorate the genocide, uh, a lot of diasporans got together, organizations got together to provide one and a half million meals in honor of the survivors of the genocide. And so they um, did a campaign to send over enough money for one and a half million meals for Feeding America, which is the nonprofit who was in charge of this. Um, so from starving Armenians, we go to resistance and resilience um, as part of the story and how Armenian women, women's guilds in church kitchens across America kind of regenerated um, Armenian food and by extension, Armenian communities. Uh, so knowing that their culinary heritage was at risk of disappearing, descendants of genocide survivors, and sometimes the genocide survivors themselves work together in churches across America to continue cooking traditions and preserve a previously orally transmitted culture by writing down recipes for the first time. Uh, they knew that they were never going to be able to access the lands that they had lived on and came from. And so these kitchens really became spaces of resistance and resilience led by women um, in every corner of America that you can imagine. Uh, much of it has surprised me as well in my own research that you, that there's, you know, Armenian communities in literally every corner of this country and in the world. But um, churches in Fresno, New York, Boston, Racine <clears throat> and Rhode Island, they got together and started cooking, creating guilds and also putting out cookbooks. So this one, <clears throat> excuse me, is from Waterville at New York. It's a St. Peter Women's Guild. And you can see them again here in this picture. Some of you might know what they're making. It's Lahajun, um, which is a like an open-faced kind of meat patty, uh, meat, uh, yeah, with bread. And so one of the most um, influential places that this happened, happened to be in Detroit, actually. So the book on the left, if you ask any Armenian American family, for sure they have this book in their um, collection, then they always remember it with the red binding. It's the Treasured Armenian Recipes. And um, this was put out in 1949 by the Detroit Women's Chapter of the Armenian General Benevolent Union. They published this book and they wrote something really profound in the opening pages of the book. And I think something that um, I found in the prefaces of a lot of Armenian cookbooks that you generally might not find in other cookbooks from other communities. Uh, and I will read you the, the passage, which is referencing a story by William Soroyan, who is an Armenian American writer and, and author. Uh, anyone who has read William Soroyan's My Name is Aram is familiar with the sad visage of a transplanted Armenian. Uncle Melik, who bought a patch of California desert from a real estate shark to plant pomegranate trees, such as he cherished from his childhood in the old country is typical. It, it does not matter that only lizards and toads inhabited this portion of the desert. What matters is that he did not give up. He tries to plant his Armenia. The bold attempt is made. The desert must be watered, nurtured, and subdued. Perhaps, who knows, the pomegranate tree will thrive where only cactus survives. A race of people who have lived 
through 25 turbulent centuries does not give up trying. Our hope is high that young Armenians will seize upon these recipes like Uncle Melik and his trees as an heirloom and make them their own. So you find several pages in, you know, in the front kind of explaining what their goal was to, in order to um, transmit this book. On the right hand side, you find a um, book that is the continuation of what Treasured Armenian Recipes did. And that this one, <clears throat> I believe, was published in the 1970s, whereas the first one was the 1950s. And that one is where you start to see the creeping in of other recipes, because, of course, after all, Armenians were in America at the time, of other cultures, um, other popular recipes of the time, and ingredients um, being replaced that could not be found. And so there's a really, really... Um, one that I love that um, most people don't know uh, about, and it has to do with kufta balls, which you know are these meat patties that you make, but you're usually supposed to use um, tahini with them, but they couldn't find tahini, so they use peanut butter. So there's a recipe in there for peanut butter kufta balls, which I always find interesting. And in fact, there are some communities today on the East Coast, I believe, who still make a recipe like that. Um, one interesting thing, again, with these cookbooks is that they go through immense effort to explain the genocide, why they're doing what they're doing, and highlight the women who are giving these recipes up um, for, the, for the book. This one is from the St. Hogwarts Church in Racine, Wisconsin, and these appear next to the recipes of the women, and so there's these long stories about how they survived, how they were orphaned, how they were brought to America as, in essence, mail order brides for Armenian men who were still in America and the recipes next to it. Um, these are just two photos from the book. Um, and here's a recipe, which is one that you don't find in, in mainstream Armenian cooking today that I, I, I really find interesting because instead of rolling the grape leaves, it's telling you to chop the grape leaves in the food. Um, and then on the right hand side, you'll find more writing in the book about how these recipes were orally transmitted and passed down from mother to daughter, and that it's not unusual to come across a dozen different ways to make a meal. These are some um, newspaper clippings from how this kind of resistance network in the kitchens across America uh, what, what happened after that. Um, the first one on the left is from 1979. And so a lot of these women's guilds would put on bazaars. And so that was an event that people really looked forward to because it was the only time that they could get together, eat these labor intensive foods made by these women in these kitchens and just in their church yards and halls, recreate the village life that they had to leave behind. Um, the one on the right I love, it's from Fresno from the 1940s, and it essentially paints the hosts of the picnic as these characters. So um, it says things like, MK Mirigian will see that you have a good time. Mrs. Margaret will see that the shish kebab is cooked to a turn. And so they, it started becoming a thing. And um, I think communities that were not even Armenian would probably sometimes go, and they do come, the ones that I've been to in the Midwest, um, it's become a, a, an opportunity for other communities to come and experience um, what Armenian food is and what culinary heritage is. Um, these slides are photos that I've taken from my cooking sessions with the St. John Armenian Church in Southfield, which is where in Michigan, which is where the Treasured Armenian Recipes book was essentially created. And um, as you can see, it's, it's more than just cooking, these women, are getting together, it's a fellowship. They are transmitting everything from news to gossip to information to me as a person who is of a younger generation and wanted to learn. Um, my time with them has been absolutely invaluable. They've taught me so much and I've learned so much from them and um, they've really made a huge difference in, in this kind of work that I've done, their recept receptiveness to, um, to me. Um, and so you can see them, you know, cooking in a row and dropping the pastry in the water to be boiled. 
this is an Armenian um, church specialty kata, which is like a, they kind of call it like an inverted croissant in a lot of ways. And the, this is a line of community members. I know it says ladies guild, but it doesn't always mean that it's just women, men participate as well. But they are making turshi, which, it, which are pickled vegetables for their bazaar. Um, these are also some photos from different other different ladies guilds, one in Boston, Massachusetts, and one in New Britain, Connecticut. Um, what I particularly love about the photo on the left is if you look at the woman um, on the right, she has a cigarette in her hand. And um, that is just is really interesting for me because I think that these, depending on your interpretation, you can say that, you know, women, <clears throat> women's cooking is really tied to patriarchal ideas, but also I think that these spaces became uh, places for women to hold power and be themselves and um, really have fellowship together. So I just found that she's smoking in there, really interesting. Um, so from that time, uh, Armenian Americans got to work in the kitchens, but also our, um, America wasn't the only place that Armenians escaped to. They, after they were marched through the desert and experienced starvation, they found refuge in cities like Beirut, Aleppo, Tehran, like my parents um, and my family, cities across Europe. So you have uh, an entire network of diasporans who are located in many different places. But then the next generations begin to experience um, displacement again. So you have the Lebanese civil war, the Cyprus conflict, the Iran-Iraq war, the collapse of the Soviet Union, and then the Karabakh war of the 90s. And so each and every single one of these world events displaced Armenians even further. Um, and unfortunately that situation hasn't exactly ended. Um, one place that Armenians had an extremely thriving community long before the genocide as well, but you know, in a, because of the genocide, because of the numbers was in Aleppo. Uh, Armenians came um, after the, the, the marches and established themselves with businesses. They had influential bakeries. They influenced the food cuisine of the area. Um, but in 2011, the Syrian civil war began, um, which was part of the Arab Spring protests. There was high youth unemployment. There was drought, crop failure, which obviously had correlations with climate change. And um, amongst the millions of people who left, um, 22,000 Syri 22, Syrian Armenians fled to Armenia. Um, it was a close place. It was the homeland and um, that's where they went. And according to the UN Refugee Agency, about 14,000 remain. But what started to happen um, was that they started to revolutionize the food culture, which had been under Soviet, Ar Armenia had been under Soviet rule for about 70 years. And so they started changing the food culture there too. So I'll go through some slides of um, Armenian children in rescue homes in Aleppo. You can see just how many there are. Um, and I wanted to put, put the, this in the presentation just to show that Armenian communities in these places felt like that was their home. They, you know, they, of course they had a Republic of Ar Armenia, but Syria and, you know, Iran and Lebanon, that was their home. And so you see in the poem on the left um, by Maru Shiramian, she's saying the soil wasn't mine, but it became mine. And this is a beautiful um, painting by another um, Aleppo native named Armina Galens. Um, so just to, you know, explain that, of course, Armenians um, had ancestral lands, but they also adopted a lot of, of the lands that they landed on. Um, and so when they got to Armenia, they found that obviously the food that the people in the Republic of Armenia were eating were very different to the food that they had grown up with. And being resourceful as ever, they started to um, open shopping centers where they could access things like za'atar and uh, spice blends and, um, pomegranate molasses to make their food. And so this is a, a the Aleppo shopping center in Yerevan, Armenia, where a lot of these spices and um, ingredients can be found. They started significantly influencing the food culture and people started taking notice. 
And so you have um, refugee restaurateurs spicing up Armenian cuisine, and they really changed um, the food culture in Armenia. And one of the most famous restaurants is one called Darian Kebab, which if you ever make it to Yerevan, I highly suggest that you visit. Uh, you will not be disappointed, but you see things on their menu that you would not find on a normal post-Soviet Armenian menu, whether that's the falafel or the ishli kufta or, or the other dishes. And so it was as if there was a reintroduction happening. Um, one personal story or uh, I want to tell about an individual is about Antil Kilislian. He was a, an Aleppo born chef who had to escape with his family to Armenia. He had a restaurant, um, his family had restaurants in Aleppo that they had to leave, leave behind. And I actually met him a couple years ago at the Smithsonian Folklife Festival. Um, and we were kind of thrown into a very interesting situation together uh, where we had to make a dish um, where I had just learned to make, he had no idea of. And so we quickly had to do that together. It was a really, um, it was a really fun introduction, but I wanted to show a bit of um, that story through a video about him, which I will show you now. Armenians, there are less than 11 million throughout the world. Just around 3 million Armenians that are living in Armenia. We've been forced to be living separate from each other for the past several centuries. Shat Heruer Town, Obais Metzheidige, Zeytunid Zarerunik. Kani Hazarat, I think, and Lave Jamanagin Vijagov, Zavakiran make it what Naratan Horatian Spaveren, which the Rapo Genocide Bajarov, the Rapo Fetzin Halep, Metsaigus, Purash Hadir on the work, who image, Vercha, Zdik Jasharam of Hazav, Baba said the Sav Panelu. Halep Shat Chigar at Jamana Krete Hayer Nain, which are up near Sovorelusk Setsin, Shinele, Badrastele, Asim Ivercho Irens Yergirnank, Yav Shat Paner or Yes Mikicharach or Badrastu make Munise or Harnet Sigam, Hamor make Avantu to Nank or Amen in Chitswech, which announced me at Sens Hatch for Behanank, Surya image, Hayer Avilijana Chwazen. Sujuho, Basterman, Sujuho, famous on the Surya war work says Nam Lipanan, our Surya, Lipanan, Coco, and Nunkil to Mevoro, a for chart and Badras men Yegan, Halebits excess amenage, Haleben Amen Supervets in Ampochashara. You're giving up your birthplace, you're giving up your friends, the families, everybody that you grow up with, but there are a lot of things that you know you leave behind, but you learn how to survive and how to move on. I never want anybody to understand what we went through because that means that you're wishing that person go through what you went through and that you don't want to have that issue or anyone Syrian mezrun tawarner i think an goshtemian in hayru darinerach abastanats dal shader manatsin yev shader agavor ter honen i think an es shat mokurner unem keriner unem kazuner unem ter honen mengal 2014 er shat Ahavoria, Vijaga, or Chain Turner, I live Stimana, Chur Chigar, Evosank Chigar Electric, Amenegar, or Churner, Shatish Barrel, Chester Nampas Adel, so Adur Amar Babain had Mr. Sank Sivor Baba Betke Langa Elves, the only Chunik Hyrenic Monink, Urish Devchankan Altar. As Sivo, Voroshwetsank, Hyrenic Altar, Katsink, Yev. Yerbu Jasharan on Ink, Tsavok Serdi Makotsereng, Hayastan Yegang, Yet Zero N, as Dick Derpat Singarach, Sandwich, Snacky, Vera Peral Signets, Chinank, Gamats Gamats Yelang, Hacho Utunkadank, Anshu Parkas Zo in Metsarigis Amno or Abu Hago Prestorane, Abu Hago Ir Metsarigis Amna, Simek Chagavore in Halebimage, Abu Hago Pano. So that's just a, a little bit about Anto's story and just how uh, relevant 
the idea of this dispossession and how close the dispersal is still to the Armenian story um, and how it, it seems to have not have really changed since 100 years ago that we're still going through these cycles. Um, if you find yourself in Yerevan, Abu Hagop is another restaurant that I would highly recommend um, to experience those Syrian Armenian flavors. And so the next cycle that we come across um, is still ongoing, uh, just recently happened. Uh, some of you might have heard about the renewed Nagorno-Karabakh war, which began on September 27th and ended November 10th with a ceasefire agreement, although um, many things are still very unclear about the entire situation. Uh, so the, the war has its roots in the modern roots in the late 80s, but in order to really understand and gr grasp it, you have to go back to the 1920s, where um, this particular region, which Armenians refer to as Artsakh, um, was always majority Armenian, but was made part of the Soviet Socialist Republic of Azerbaijan at the time. In the 80s, when the Soviet Union was falling apart, the region voted to be independent or be reunited with Armenia and um, violence broke out. And so there were pogroms against Armenians in Azerbaijan and um, hundreds of thousands had to escape. And the war went on for about five, four or five years and thousands of lives were lost in the process, both for Armenians and Azerbaijanis as well. Um, there was a ceasefire agreement since 1994, but um, that all changed on September 27th. And um, it, it was, uh, it's hard to talk about it as if it was, it was because it's still kind of happening. And I think everyone who is of Armenian descent is still really processing what happened and, and what the future holds for Armenians, which just gives you an insight into how our situation still seems to be as precarious as ever. But um, an entire generation was lost. Everyone is, is traumatized. And um, that has been compounded by uh, social networks, um, the information that is spread on these social networks about uh, war crimes. And um, so you're, you're, you're seeing it in real time. So it, it doesn't matter if you're in Los Angeles or in Lebanon, uh, you seeing it on the screen, it, it's as if you're experiencing it, even though it's happening to a portion of the population that you share um, your ethnic background with. Uh, so these are some um, ancient sites in Garbagh. This is Garbagh on the map on the left. You can see it's like a autonomous area. Um, I believe about 30% of what this map on the white shows has been left to Armenians. Um, the Azerbaijani military uh, force fully grab these lands again. And so uh, displacing uh, many, many people in the region. But um, I just wanted to show on the right that there are sites in that area that are extremely special to Armenians. The one on the right is a um, the birthplace of the Armenian language. The one on the left is a very, very special old, I think, I believe, fourth century church. And so just to give you an idea of what that region means for Armenians as well. Um, this was a interesting issue that I covered just before the war started. Uh, there were skirmishes and in Moscow where there are Armenians and Azerbaijanis living together. Um, during the skirmishes, a proxy war kind of evolved through apricots, um, Azerbaijani, uh, the community there filmed themselves stomping on these Armenian apricots that were being imported into Russia. And that kind of went off um, and led to a kind of a fruit war that was going on there. Food related to the diaspora too. So in Los Angeles is where uh, food culture is, um, Armenian food culture is very diverse and very obvious. So there's restaurant owners, cafe owners, business owners, and they rallied together to support um, fundraising efforts for this war that way. They uh, were donating 100% of their profits from their restaurants to the war effort, which is really saying a lot, especially in this time of the pandemic where restaurants are and small businesses are under such strain. 
Um, this was a very, very touching photo of a man who had to leave his home after the cease agreement was signed and territories were ceded over. And so this is just um, another example of the Armenian story taking in the same forms that it did 100 years ago. We still have dispossession, we still have loss, we still have ancestral heritage being left behind, most likely never to be accessed again. Um, this um, is one of those examples. This man, um, I took these stills from a, a, a video report, but this, this is this man's last harvest in his fields that he was able to access the last time he will ever be able to pick fruit in them. He took them all and brought them to Yerevan to sell. And I just thought it was interesting. Uh, this is also a uh, huge loss as well. This winery, which was located in Nagorno-Karabakh, Artsakh, lost everything. Their entire winery and vineyards were located in regions that were seeded. And so this business has essentially disappeared. And I believe that they were one of the only places that were um, the, the grape that they're using is indigenous to virtually that area only. And so it's a huge loss on that front as well. And the war has presented other issues as well, including a food security risk. Um, a lot of the land that was being used as the breadbasket where they were growing legumes and rye and other kinds of wheat products uh, was seeded. And so this could present a security risk, not just to the people of the region, but also Armenia as well. 95,000 hectares of arable land was lost. Um, and then this is, these are just issues to think about in the future. A lot of these border villages, because of the conflict, were not able to properly use the land for agricultural purposes because of the ongoing war. They were always afraid of being shot at. And you can see in the picture to the right, they're growing their fruit in a greenhouse rather than just in the, um, in the open air. And um, it remains to be seen what all of this means with a, this agreement signed for Armenians and the fate of these border villages as well. So it's not so much that region anymore, but there are border issues and obviously food as well as climate change, which is affecting these regions um, goes hand in hand with that. And just to end on a quote, um, for Armenians, the, and for a lot of people, uh, the past is never dead, it's not even past. Um, and so I guess as just the conclusion to this kind of 100 year saga, um, I hope that it kind of gives an idea of the um, just diversity and complexity of the Armenian story. Um, and for me, the easiest language in which to kind of tell these stories is through food. Uh, they look like that they're separate events, and of course they are with their own details, but in the Armenian psyche, they all seem to be connected. And it seems that we, we keep living these stories over and over again. Um, and I think for me personally with this project, uh, food is also about how you approach things to start learning about them, not just where they end. So I, I'm always saying food should never be the end of the story. It's always the beginning. It's always a gateway to bigger stories, bigger intersectional issues, whether that's people's histories, um, politics, culture, climate change, class, race. It's kind of a language in which we can communicate with each other and um, uh, it can lead us on the path to justice, whatever that means for, for the communities you're from. But uh, that, that is basically the end. Um, thank you so much for everyone who joined in, for, who stayed and, and who, who was interested in the topic. I, I can't tell you how much I, I appreciate you being here. Um, Armenians don't really get a chance often to be part of a bigger complex issues like this and connect with other communities. And so uh, I, I really appreciate the opportunity and that this was interesting enough for everyone to join along. And I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have um, at this point. Um, can I just speak up or? Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, it was a terrific presentation. Thank you so much. Um, and I wanted to let you know, in case you don't know, that there's a video uh, made by Caroline Babayan, who is an Armenian originally from Iran, who um, ended up in um, 
Norway. And it's called Hamburger and Doma, and you can find it online. And it, it focuses on five Armenian women talking about being Armenian over making Doma. Yes, um, I've actually- Central. Um, I've watched that video so many times. <laughs> I love it. And I met, you might know Janice. Do you, do you yes, know Janice? I, know I, I met her and she told me about it. And I, when I saw it, I couldn't believe it. And so it's, it's really been a source of um, just comfort and inspiration for me to watch that video. So thank you so much. And thank you for your work. I'm so excited that you're. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Thanks for talking about it. Actually, my memoir is also full of food. Amazing. Okay. I look forward to that. Thank you so much. And the, and the video is um, open access. You can just put hamburger and dolma in the, in the search engine and it'll come up. Yeah, if anyone wants to access it, it's a beautiful kind of um, look and perspective into the lives of, of these women through, this, through food. And you just have to Google hamburgers and dolma and I'm sure it will come up. I don't think there's any other uh, video named <laughs> with that title. Leanna, are yes. you going to be writing a book? Yes, um, I'm currently attempting to. Uh, I'm focusing on several, maybe about 10 or 12 stories that encompass diaspora food and the different stories about how um, Armenians not only put themselves together through this food, but also contributed immensely to, to American cuisine and those, those footprints that not only Armenians, but the general public really doesn't know about. And so I hope to sometime in the near future have something out. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah, your research is fabulous. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for being here. It's completely ongoing. It's even a learning process for me too. Um, I'm learning about my own heritage and the complex Armenian uh, diaspora as well. So um, I'm happy to share this space with all of you today. I just want to kind of explore the gender space, you know, because um, it's true. A lot of my respondents said, you know, um, my mother was in the kitchen, but it was a place of power. But I think it's dangerous to not to stop there mm -hmm. because I mean, culture is patriarchal. Yeah, wherever it is, it's patriarchal. Whether it's in Turkey or Iran or or L.A., you know, it's patriarchal. So I think that the oh, get ready. Pardon? Well, anyway, I, I just think that yes, there is some authority in the kitchen, but the power is still mostly with the men. Yeah. Oh, and I agree. I don't think that has changed much. And I think that you're, you know, you're aware of that. I just needed to say it because yeah, it's absolutely. very much part of the Armenian. I mean, in culture, and you know, when you talk about cultural preservation, there's stuff you want to keep, and then there's stuff you want to change. And it doesn't make you yeah. less Armenian because you want to change patriarchal, racist parts of our culture. Absolutely. Yeah, I, absolutely. I think that's an amazing point, and um, that if we want to move forward, it, like it's dynamic, it has to change, right? And so, those things have to happen, um, but yes, there are very, very strong elements of it. Uh, in this part, I chose to focus on the very uh, aspect of the power, but absolutely, I agree with you. Arlene, at the, at the same time, you look at was the women who kept the culture. It's the women who, who had the orphanages, the women who created the guilds. I mean, that's kind of the lie, isn't it? that we make the men <laughs> feel like they're <laughs> the pachas, but it's really the women who have kept Armenian culture alive. Uh, well, also it depends on who writes the history. Well, you know that, I know that, some people know that, but when you read a history, it's the men because the men are writing the history, you know, so. And I, I you know, it, it, I think one of the effects of genocide is to hold on to the culture so hard that it ossifies. And I've seen that. I've worked with Armenian organizations a long time ago and I gave up because th there is a resistance to change. And if a culture doesn't change, it's going to die. 
That's another effect of the genocide, I think, you know, a lasting more than 100 years effect. Yeah. No, I, I agree. Yeah, I agree with that. Even the food, like in these women's guilds that I was cooking with, like some of them have commented to me that these foods are like museum pieces to them because the food itself isn't changing either. So, you know, it has changed, of course, in Turkey, but when you're right. in diaspora, the way that they made it in the villages a hundred years ago is literally the way that you're doing it today. So even that aspect of it um, isn't, isn't changing. And, and I think they're noticing, but I think there's also a lot of young generations who are trying to do things with the food, but yeah, just a tangent. I had a question about that actually, um, in relation to what you just said about the, the women's guilt and how it's mostly kind of this older generation of women. And I'm just curious if you see that they're inviting the younger generation to participate like actively, or if you see the young generation seeking it out themselves or what's kind of the dynamic yeah. between the generations? Uh, that is a very complicated question. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, so, I will say that they have commented to me that when they tried to learn, they were not very welcome sometimes because again, it's a power thing too, right? That these women are trying to hold on to these recipes. And um, if they tell you how to do it, they're losing some of that very little power that they have. So that there's, there's that element to it. That people have commented to me, you know, 30 years ago to 40 years ago when I tried to learn and get into the guild it wasn't you know I didn't really have success but I think that now we're in a time where a lot of the women are understanding that if they don't transmit that information in new exciting ways maybe to a newer generation that it will be lost so when I go and cook with the guilds I really am the youngest person there and the gap between me and the women who are cooking is maybe 50 years I would say um, and so I think it's just a matter of communicating it differently. I think that the people who have responded to what I've been doing clearly are very interested. They want to understand that heritage, even if they're even a quarter Armenian or less, it means something to them still. So it's just a matter of presentation. I think, um, I think that there are young people interested, but they are not, um, aware or able to access the, the spaces in which the women are particularly cooking in. It just needs a medium to kind of translate that to, to, to a newer generation. Fabulous. And can I ask one more question about the recipe books that you showed, um, sure. the treasured recipes and things? Where, do you, where does one access that or where do you find that? So uh, there are several bookshops. I believe the AGBU bookshop has the treasured Armenian recipes. Um, there is a bookstore called Abril, A-B-R-I-L bookstore. If you uh -huh. Google it, it will come up. It's a bookstore in LA uh, that would ship it to you. Uh, so there are places that Armenian cultural kind of sites and bookstores that you can access it. It's really easy. You might even find it on Amazon as well. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks for everything. This presentation was awesome. Uh, thank you for being yeah. here and for your really good questions. The Desu Tune, Liana. Thank you so much. Hi, can you hear me? Is... Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh. Yes, sorry, I, I don't you. know when. I was just wondering, uh, so do you have examples of how specific recipes have changed over time. Specifically, I, so I, I, do, um, I do food research and I live the year in Aleppo. And a lot of these recipes are very time intensive. And as people have less and less time, they take shortcuts and the recipes evolve. I was just wondering if you, through your research, found specific ways traditional dishes are made that are no longer made that way. I'm particularly curious about like, the time aspect. And thank you again uh, for your presentation. It was wonderful. Yeah, no, thank you for your question and for being here. You mean um, dishes that have uh, changed because of time, like as in the labor intensiveness of the dish? Yeah, like doma, like, uh, you know, rolling uh, grape leaves or stuffing uh, vegetables. Mm -hmm. These are very time intensive dishes or like forming manti, the, the dumplings. Yeah. 
Yeah, um, I see them. I see them changing mostly in Armenian cooking Facebook groups that I'm part of. You, when you have opened it up to so many different people that are attempting to help each other, so you'll see modifications of recipes in those groups. Um, for example, a common one that I see is when Armenians are making manti or manta, which are those little dumplings. Um, to save time, some people will use wonton wrappers to do them instead of rolling out the dough. Um, of course, back in the day, women were making filo themselves. No one now even dares to make filo. So everyone's buying that from the store. Um, but some of these dishes, it is because of their labor intensiveness and time intensiveness that kind of adds to their security risk in a lot of ways. Um, a lot of communities that are in the diaspora, in America particularly, that don't live in Los Angeles, uh, can only access the foods through bazaars and church picnics and there's only a set of like these women who are making them so sometimes it's only once a year that the people who are coming to the bazaar get to taste that food because they don't have the time to make it themselves um, and so I think that time intention adds to the security risk but sure of course yeah they, there are modifications all the time Facebook seems to be one of the most dynamic places in which I'm seeing a lot of that those changes and, and people coming up with their own kind of ways to do things and then telling their community community about it. Thank you. Thank you. I have I had a question. Hi. 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 I'm I'm talking to you from um, the fruit basket of the nation, California, and uh, wanted to just thank you for helping me recognize, I, I'm a Palestinian American. My, my father grew up in Jerusalem and Aleppo. And um, through your work, I've, I've really slowly divorced some of the foods that I recognized as Palestinian as really Armenian and fruits that, um, you know, that have been pickled and I've been eating for, for, for years. Um, I thought were Palestinian are, are really uh, Armenian. And so it made me think about um, this sort of growing movement of recognizing the genocide, you know, within the United States, of course, and, and throughout the world. And even in Turkey, people um, realizing that they have, you know, our, the, the sort of discussion about the genocide is becoming more um, prevalent and people realizing that they have Armenian heritage. Mm -hmm. And cooking those dishes, maybe within their their families, and not realizing why they were doing that. Sort of a, I've heard about you know being crypto Judaic and crypto um, Armenian, and uh, you know realizing oh wow I, I we're cooking these foods we're cooking these dishes and we don't realize why because they had to hide you know their identities. So I wonder if. If you know, you know, any, anything more about that or anybody writing about that, I'd, I'd love to learn more um, on that, on that subject. About kind of parsing the food out to get yeah. to the, yeah, it's an interesting thing. Um, to be honest with you, it's something that I think that populations who have mixed with other populations struggle with all the time, uh, because uh, it's not often that I get to say the word Armenian food because Armenian food is, is like I said, really diverse, right? And so there's so many other elements um, and it's very hard to parse out who made what, who was the originator of what. They all kind of mix together. Um, one of the things that has happened to, people have said it personally to me, but it happens all the time is that there are these food wars, right? So someone saying, you stole this food, that's not really your food. Um, uh, you didn't, you didn't, you know, these are all with, uh, they're all called Turkish. Why are Armenians stealing this food? So, but I think the, the questions are, if you start to question why those dishes are called those things and start to go back, you understand that it's, it's bigger than just one thing being called a certain way. Um, I know that pa Palestinian food and the recognition of it is also a huge area, an emerging area. Uh, you, you see a lot of cookbooks now, amazing cookbooks that are being written um, about Palestinian food and giving it its due. So I think that it's very, um, it's new. We haven't gotten to the point where 
um, we're kind of talking about that in a very mainstream way yet. Um, like I said, the very fact that Armenian food is being included in something like this or, or that my work has been receptive is, is an amazing, huge shock to me in a lot of ways because we don't get that seat at the dinner table. Um, and so I think it's an emerging thing. I think, I think people are starting to talk about it. I don't know anyone in particular, but I'm, I'm, I don't know if you are familiar with some of the Palestinian cookbooks, but I'm happy to send some links your way. I think that people in that realm are doing amazing work. Um, and um, I think the more we talk about it, the more that we kind of parse out these issues, but um, it hasn't fully reached its peak yet, so to say. We're still kind of discovering it and discovering each other and what all of that means. So I don't know if that answered your question at all, but- um, Sure, thank you. You bring up really interesting points and I'm, I'm so happy that you're part of this conversation because I, the Palestinian, food and the Palestinian story is very important and dear to me as well. And so I thank you for, for being part of it. <laughs> I was gonna say the food wars are really, they're real. You probably yeah. know this and they're legal, you know, like who owns feta cheese? All right. Okay. <laughs> the Greeks own feta cheese now. It's a legal decision that the Greeks own feta cheese, a certain area in France owns Roquefort cheese, you know, and if you go to buy feta cheese and it's not Greek, it's called white cheese. Right. So, but for me, I don't know, I've been to Turkey like eight times or nine times, you know, and walking the streets, like, I, I just, how do you parse this out? When these communities have yeah. lived next to each other for thousands of years, you know, there was a genocide, but before the genocide and before, you know, the, the, the other killing of Armenians, there were Armenians and Turks living and sharing food. You know, I, my grandmother was from Kastamonu and I went there and there was a Bastama shop there, supposed to be the best Bastama in Turkey, you know, and, and my grandmother probably bought her Bastama from there, you know, so she didn't make it herself, you know, so, and it was a Turkish shop. So I, I don't think there's ever going to be a clear demarcation, you know, this is Palestinian, this is Armenian, this is Turkish, you know. I, I agree. Just, yeah, I, I think it's a futile search to try yeah. to figure that out. I, you know, um, we just have to be aware that we can all share it, that no one can be dispossessed from it, you know? Um, yeah, I agree. I, and yeah, it's impossible. It's impossible when you have people who have lived together for thousands of years, how do you, how do you tell who originated what? And also it's really not that complicated if we're talking about things like kebab, for example, it's really just meat being grilled on a stick, or it's really just um, you know, something being rolled in a grape leaf. It's not rocket science and food spreads, it's dynamic. It, it goes beyond borders. And so we can't assign people to it and then put the demark that they're the only ones who make that food or they're the only ones who own or cook that food. So, yeah. And it's, it's even in the language, you know, I was, yeah. I mean, it was my first language but I don't speak it anymore. But I remember the names of foods, right? Yeah. So I go to Turkey and it's Patlijan. <laughs> is that an Armenian word or is it a Turkish word? It's the words that the Turks use. So I said, oh, Pythlajan, that's a Turkish word. And my Turkish friend said, maybe it's an Armenian word. Yeah. I mean, Absolutely. like, how are we ever going to know? It's and it's, But it's also interesting. That I've, I've been hearing a lot of stories of Turkish families within Turkey that, you know, they have Armenian. They're sort of coming out as Armenian because... There's mm -hmm. more of a, you call it recognition. I mean, hundreds of thousands. Recognition of, hundreds of thousands, the estimate is, you know. Right. And, and uh, so now that, you know, they're asking their grandparents, um, you know, why are we cooking these foods? Oh, well, the secret's out now where I'm actually part Armenian. Um, but, you know, for so many years, I wasn't allowed to talk about it. But it's so interesting how that, you know, sort of, you know, this day and age is sort of, highlighting that, that there are really Armenian roots to um, some of the Turkish. This was, this was um, highlighted by a book by Fethiye Çetin. 
which is a wonderful book. It's been translated into 12 languages, uh, including Armenian. Uh, and uh, it, it talks about her grandmother being on the march and being taken off the march and raised as a Turk, but remembering always that she was Armenian. And she told Fethiye about it when Fethiye was about 20. And then Fethiye wrote the book. Uh, I mean, it's a very long story, but um, what happened was people came to her and wrote to her and said, my grandmother too, my great grandmother too. My, so, you know, then she and Aisha Dul Alfini wrote a book called The Grandchildren, which is translated into English. So if any of you are interested, you know, they, they, but My Grandmother is a beautiful book. It's a very small book, but very beautiful. And it's Fethiye Chetin. Shall I put that in the chat? Please do. Yeah, and I just wanted to thank you. This um, just resonated so much with me and the recipes that my grandmother just finally allowed me to photograph her handwritten recipes. And I was telling my wife who's Japanese and Hawaiian, you know, my grandmother wouldn't let go. We talked about in college, you know, my Armenian roommates would come home and they'd want to learn my grandmother's Yalanchu recipe. She would not let go of the recipe. She would make us leave the room for her final ingredient. And she only gave the recipe to my roommate when my roommate told her that she had her grandmother's recipe from um, Bolis, which was Sarma or Yalanchi stuffed into mussels. I forgot the name of it. Yeah, media Dolma. Media yeah. Dolma. I yeah. love that. It was like a business deal. <laughs> You give me that one and I'll look over it and then I'll let you know if you can have this one. And so, you know, kind of letting go of these recipes that have been our identity. It's like a cultural artifact. It's the land that we lost. Everything that you said today made so much sense. So thank you. Thank you so much for saying that and for being here and that, you know, that, that, that dynamic is really interesting. To me, I, I meet so many people who have stories like, like just the one that you describe. Um, there was one woman that I remember speaking to who uh, had her, her mother-in-law had a chemin recipe. So for people who are watching who don't know, chemin is what you would use to make bostoma, which is the cured meat. And she would not for the life of her give up this recipe. And she got sick and on her deathbed gave it up, but survived actually and made this woman swear up and down that <laughs> she would not be giving this recipe to anyone else because it was, you know, supposed to stay with her. So yeah, you find a lot of these stories. It's really interesting, but thank yeah. you. She said the photographs are only for me. that <laughs> No one can see the photographs either. So yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Does anyone have any more questions or comments? I was just going to ask if someone has a recipe for chaman. I had no idea that it was a mix because when I looked up chaman, I used to use it in Aleppo. It was just, I thought it was um, fenugreek. Right. But I, but the one in Aleppo is like yellow. And I was like, fenugreek, I, the one that I found in the state is not yellow. And so what else goes into chaman? Um, there's cumin. Um, I, I can look at one of my books and tell you that, but there's like a bunch of stuff that goes into it and it's a mix. And I'm sure if you Google it, I'm sure recipes would come up, but people are very protective over their family made mixes, um, over it. But, um, let's see if I can, I can find it here and then I, I can, I can put it in there as well. Thank you. It must have cayenne pepper in it because it's hot. I think. And I would say paprika. So, yeah. It's red. Um, let's see here. I can't find it in here now, but every, every, like, for example, this, this cookbook probably has it. I just can't find it right now. 
the Armenian cookbook or the Treasured Armenian Recipes has it. Um, if you just look up Chemen, you'll come across many different versions. But for some reason, I people are really protective over that spice mixture in families. So. I just want to quickly say that I am so, so, so deeply sorry to Liana and to you all for the, te the technical difficulties. Um, I'm so happy you could continue the conversation here, but please accept my sincerest apologies for having to change the Zoom links so abruptly. That, that was completely my fault. Um, so we will be following up with you all when the recordings are prepared for you to watch in case you miss any bits and pieces. So thank you so much again for your understanding and for joining us. So you will be yeah. sending us a link to the recording because I, I have a Armenian friend from Yerevan and I think he would love that, um, the video that you showed. Of course, yeah, yeah. yeah oh, are you referring to Liana's video that she that she shared or the recording of this Zoom? The recording of this. Yeah, okay. I, I've, got the, I've got the link to that, but. Okay, yeah. great, yeah, this will be available and I'll send it out yeah. to all the attendees. Wonderful. You'll have that. Great. Yeah. And Thank no you. worries at all on the disconnection. We found each other again. So <laughs> Thank you so much. Cool. Great presentation. Thank you. It was Thank wonderful. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much, Arlene, for being here. I've been such a fan of your work for such a long time. So it was really nice I'm to so connect. I'm so glad. It was sold out. And Ishin actually got me in. Because I know oh, Ishin. Good. Cool. Um, and the rest of you, everybody, thank you. I really, you know, when I kind of talk about this stuff, you don't really expect anyone else to take that much of an interest, but it was really, really nice to see everybody um, in here and, and to have this resonate with everybody and for your great questions and partic participation, I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. I think it's for us it's the same thing. We want to, we are all so very interested in this topic and, and you're doing it. So thank you. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I'm I'm accessible if you know people have further questions. Um, you can really easily find me on the internet, so we <laughs> can keep talking. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye, Bye everyone. Thank you again. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.